A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you all. Wonderful to see a fairly large audience. That's brilliant. Well, welcome to this session, which is all about uh, managing the macro-financial impacts of climate action. Now, we know that progress on climate change has fallen short, and that's really uh, part of the reason that there's a lot of policymakers, and they're worried about lots of things, uh, particularly concerns over the potentially negative effects, factors like greenflation, uh, potentially uh, a reduction in growth, uh, rising inflation, and of course, you've got lots of impacts uh, such as substantial uh, financial and fiscal costs as well, and dislocation. So in this session, we will discuss how fixing the climate crisis could impact economies, and we'll be suggesting policy solutions to ease the short-term impacts of that. And of course, all of this is tied very much to the theme of this year's annual general meeting at the ADB, which is bridging to the future. Unless we discuss and address policymaker concerns over the short-term costs of climate action and help recognize the opportunities that the transition presents for the future, we will never reap the benefits of uh, climate damage. Now, before I invite our panelists onto the stage, we'd like to start with a special introduction sent by Misa Tanaka, the head of the research at the Bank of England, who sets up the context uh, ahead of our discussion today. So please have a look at, this, uh, at the screen. Thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar and apologies for not being able to participate in person. Today, I will mainly focus my talk on how central banks and financial supervisors have tried to manage the macrofinancial impacts of climate action so far and where further actions might be needed. I should say at the outset that the views I'm expressing in this talk are my own and not the official views of the Bank of England. Central banks and financial sector supervisors have been cooperating on improving the understanding of financial risks from climate change for about a decade now. The initial work focused on improving disclosure of climate-related financial risks in order to enable financial markets to price such risks and allocate capital more effectively. This work was led by the Financial Stability Board's Task Force for, uh, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which has developed a framework for disclosing climate-related risks and opportunities for public companies. At the same time, multiple central banks and supervisors have also taken actions to improve the awareness of climate-related risks by financial firms. These measures made it more likely that financial markets will respond to future announcements of climate mitigation policies in an orderly manner, although it is less clear whether they have contributed to a reduction in carbon emissions. Central banks and supervisors have also cooperated to better understand macrofinancial risks arising from climate change through the Network for Greening the Financial System since 2017. NGFS has been publishing climate scenarios to inform central banks, supervisors and private sector players to assess both the macrofinancial risks posed by climate change and the opportunity of timely climate mitigation. This chart shows the projected impact on global GDP of different climate transition scenarios relative to a baseline of no climate change and no policy actions. It shows that for the global economy, the net zero transition by 2050 will entail smaller costs than continuing with current policies. But the cost of net zero transition will vary across countries and regions, depending on the structure of the economy and the dependence on fossil fuels and the trade composition. So for example, the short-term GDP impact of net zero transitions are projected to be highest in developing Europe and the US, as shown on the left-hand side chart here. What this means is that it is not possible to talk in general terms what the magnitude of effects from climate mitigation policies will be. Climate mitigation policies are likely to have both supply and demand effects, 
but the overall effect is likely to depend on the economic structure as well as the policy design, such as, for example, how carbon pricing is implemented and how carbon tax revenues are used. But governments are more likely to be able to reduce the negative short-run impacts of climate mitigation policies by pre-announcing and pre-committing to both their designs and timing of implementation. If there is a clear commitment from the government on certain paths of climate mitigation, private sector actors would be better placed to adjust their business models and investment strategies. Central banks would also be able to anticipate the implied relative price shocks and respond appropriately so as to keep inflation stable. A politically more challenging issue is that such policies can have distributional consequences. And there is indeed some evidence that carbon pricing has affected poorer households more than richer households. The distributional consequences of climate mitigation policies would therefore need to be addressed both in their design and by targeted fiscal policy measures. As climate change intensifies, financial regulators and governments will also need to tackle the issue of uninsurability as a way of managing both the macro financial and distributional consequences from climate change. Uninsurability arises when insurers explicitly refuse to cover certain risks or the cost of covering such risks becomes so high that it becomes practically unaffordable. There is already evidence that uninsurability has become an issue for specific regions and specific hazards, such as wildfires. And uninsurability can have multiple consequences for the wider economy. First, assets which have become uninsurable will fall in value, which will reduce collateral value securing loans. The lower collateral values means less finance for investment, which reduces demand in the short term, but also the long run, uh, long term supply of the economy. Second, the fall in collateral value also increases the probability of default as borrowers have weaker incentives to repay the loans and also the loss given default. The resulting losses for lenders will also reduce their capability to lend and also reduces investment. And third, underinsurance will also delay and hamper any post-disaster reconstruction in regions that are affected by re uh, weather-related catastrophes. In the affected, if the affected areas play a key role in the supply chains, this could potentially also cause prolonged damage to supply chains. Governments and regulators could potentially play a role in mitigating the problem of uninsurability by encouraging a large and liquid global market for weather-related catastrophe risks to develop. Indeed, global diversification could offer at least a partial solution to the problem of, of uninsurability to the extent that correlation between weather-related catastrophes across the world is limited. Such a market could mitigate the rise in insurance premium by enabling the transfer of such risks outside the insurance industry. Institutional and retail investors may have an interest in investing in weather-related catastrophe risk products, given that they are largely uncorrelated with macroeconomic risks. For example, investing in better, more granular data to enable financial actors to price such risks more accurately could help develop such markets and reduce uncertainty premium. Such work could partic be particularly valuable in developing economies and emerging markets where data gaps are large and the problem of underinsurance is more acute. Better data could also help expand the availability of parametric insurance, which promises a fixed amount of payout as soon as a specified event materializes. Because the extent of the loss resulting from an event does not need to be verified, the payout can be rapid. A recent report by Swiss Re suggests that some catastrophes, such as hurricanes, are relatively easy to create parametric products for because there is lots of historical data on wind speeds and, uh, and, and also storm tracks. So better data could potentially also expand availability of such products for other hazards. So let me conclude. So I think the progress in improving climate disclosures and awareness of financial institutions 
has made it more likely that financial markets will respond to future climate mitigation policy announcements in a more orderly manner. Um, but to, to mitigate the negative short-term effects of climate mitigation policies, it would be helpful if governments can pre-announce their design and also pre-commit to the timing of implementation. And that would help both private sector and also central bank to prepare better in order to respond to such policies. Distributional consequences of such mitigation policies will need to be addressed by the design of such policies themselves and by targeted fiscal policy measures. And I think more work is needed to address uh, the problem of uninsurability, for example, by investing in better and more granular data on weather-related catastrophes. And that would also help mitigate the macro, uh, macro financial consequences of climate change itself as governments implement uh, mitigation policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was Misa Tanaka from the Bank of England, who very ably sets up the context of the discussion that we're due to have in the next uh, hour or more. And uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists now to uh, join us on stage. Uh, first up, we have the ADB's chief economist, uh, Albert Park. He's the bank's uh, spokesperson on economic and development trends. He has more than two decades of experience as a development economist. We've pretty much seen you everywhere on the stage at this conference, so thank you, Albert, for coming and joining us. Next up, we have Jessica Isaacs, the Deputy Director for Multilateral Development Banks at the U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, she represented the U.S. at the boards of the World Bank and the African Development Bank, and also spent time at the International Energy Agency in Paris. And finally, Thomas Helbling is the uh, Deputy Director of the IMF's Asia-Pacific Department. He oversees the IMF's work on China, Korea, Mongolia, and regional issues. And he's worked as far afield as Mexico, Indonesia, the Philippines, on a wide range of issues and countries since joining the IMF in 1994. Welcome, all of you, and a big round of applause to our panelists. Now, as I mentioned, I'm looking forward to this, this discussion. It, it is quite a lengthy discussion, but I do want to hear from all of you in the audience. So please do ask questions. And in order to do so, you can scan the QR code that's about to come up. There you are. Do take your phones out, scan the QR code, and this will give you uh, a chance to ask our panelists questions at the end of our session. I will be getting to those questions. We do absolutely want to hear from all of you. Now, I'm going to start with a fairly you know, open-ended question at the start for you all. Uh, we just heard uh, from uh, Tanaka-san um, outlining some of the issues that uh, are, you know, at work when it comes to trying to mitigate some of the uh, costs of climate action. So how might climate change policies affect growth, inflation, employment, and finance in emerging and developing economies in the short to medium term, we're looking at between now to 2030. Albert. Well, I think uh, uh, Ms. Tanaka's presentation laid out some facts and um, sometimes it's confusion about confusing to think about how uh, to uh, look at costs and benefits of climate action. A lot of the integrated assessment models where she so showed that it's actually uh, better for growth to have action than inaction, those models kind of assume that markets are working well and they focus on how, how climate uh, higher temperatures actually damage economic activity through various channels including labor productivity on hot days or floods and other disasters or uh, shocks to energy supply and demand caused by higher temperatures. Um, and if you do that and just look at the economic costs, actually you find that it's beneficial in an economic sense to act. So there's no negative cost. At the same time in her last slide, she says, oh, how do we mitigate the negative effects of the short and medium term consequences? And, and the reason why there may be negative effects in the short term is that, um, we don't live in a world of perfect markets where we have carbon prices that we can look at costs and benefits in a simpler way. Uh, we have frictions in terms of financial markets, in terms of uh, supply chains, also in terms of labor markets. 
And these frictions means that some actions or inactions will have different consequences. Then you need to, as she mentioned, look caref more carefully at each country's structure of the economy and the types of policies they're adopting, et cetera. But broadly, I don't think it's necessarily the case that climate action would be negative for growth because the damages, this is actually also in a global sense, because some of the benefits of climate action kind of assume that other countries are also acting so we get temperatures down. If that's true, then there are definitely highly positive returns for the economy to act aggressively on climate. The other ones on infl uh, inflation, the evidence is pretty weak that it has a very modest effect in the shorter term. And then on employment, usually the jobs gained from renewable energy sector growth offset the lost jobs from lost coal jobs or fossil fuel related jobs. So I don't think that's a first order concern either. Okay, and these are things that we'll go on to talk about uh, in depth as we go into the panel. Jessica, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I think I'm very well aligned to what the other speakers have said, which is that how climate policies ultimately impact the economy is dependent on how those policies are designed. And so good climate policy design can also be good economic policy to bolster growth and employment and create new economic opportunities at the same time that we can manage inflationary pressures. So the design of the policy is really critical. So as economic policymakers looking at designing climate change policy, I think a really important facet is as governments think about what the resources are that they need to execute good climate policy, what are the areas where they can find, uh, apart from fiscal space that they have, how can they leverage more resources into their economies to drive the, the green transition? Uh, and so this would be you know, sources of climate finance, uh, international financial institution finance, but also leveraging the private sector, which will really be key to allowing countries to fully uh, transition to net zero and, and undertake green transitions. So ultimately designed well with private capital leverage. Uh, I think, like Albert said, it's not a given that climate change policy would cost more uh, than it would actually benefit the economy. Uh, and that's particularly true if we go further and uh, account for the social cost of carbon and, and the negative externalities of climate change over time. Uh, this cost of inaction will uh, weaken macro fiscal fundamentals uh, in the long term. So as many of the countries that the bank serves are simultaneously confronting both macro fiscal challenges and uh, increasing climate risks, I think these well-designed policies, which MDBs, the IMF, are well-positioned to help design uh, financing from the international institutions and leveraging the private sector, you know, there will be a lot of macro fiscal upsides. Yeah. Great to hear. And Thomas, uh, your take. Um, thank you, and, and, and good afternoon. So. Thinking as a macroeconomist, uh, you know, it's probably true that in the short term or sort of in the horizon until 2030, uh, climate change policies will have a negative uh, impact overall. Although, just as a caveat, I think it's important to keep uh, in mind what we're comparing the cost uh, against. So it's against the baseline of no climate action. This assumes that the negative effects of climate change, which, ha which have been documented with uh, a lot of research, will not materialize significantly until 2030. So until 2030, if, the, if we impose a price on carbon, it basically means that one input becomes more expensive. And the question then also depends on how much more expensive the alternative, namely clean energy is. But sort of on the current assumption, typically it's a small adverse supply shock. Uh, and as Albert mentioned though, there are, very, there are important differences across the economy. So some sectors of the economy will lose, so to speak, while others will gain if climate uh, change policies are implemented still the net relative to a baseline, which may be more fictitious than real in the end, is, is still negative. So I think from our narrow uh, perspective in macroeconomic management, I think it's a huge change uh, to implement and achieve the changes needed in the economy, both in terms of power generation, 
depending on initial condition, how much uh, capacity to pr produce renewables, for example, is available, there may be substantial investment needs. And there's the question then on the economic organization of the sector. Uh, it's also a big challenge to manage uh, climate change uh, from a public finance perspective, in particular if there's strong adaptation needs. For some of our economies in our department, these adaptation investment needs mount, amount to several percentage points of GDP, which without changes in fiscal frameworks can put huge stresses on, on, on public finances. So it's even if the costs in the aggregate are small, I think it's still a big challenge to uh, implement all the policies needed, both uh, in terms of generated, generating the clean energy uh, needed to, to achieve climate change goals, and then manage all the other uh, tasks along with it, including uh, distributional effects. Um, one thing, finally, just to make is in, in terms just of time horizon, and maybe we come back to some of the costs in terms of magnitudes. A lot of our work goes back two, three years. We've already, relative to the 2030 benchmark, we have already lost two or three years. So the issue is the longer we wait, the bigger the challenge will be sort of in terms of macroeconomic impact because we need to achieve more in a shorter time horizon. And the shorter time horizon, if we need to achieve a lot in a short time, then it will be more disruptive. I think that's one of the fundamental uh, challenges we're, we're facing. Great. Thank you so much for that, Thomas. And thank you for outlining. We will get into the cost shortly, but Albert, you wanted to uh, respond yeah, to I, that. Yeah, I wanted to add maybe or respond to uh, those comments. Um, I mean, one reason why you see negative costs up to 2030 is that, you know, even if we act now, it takes a while to really change the temperature. That takes, so the, the benefits will grow over time and should be accounted for even in current action. But the other thing in our modeling that we did in our report we issued last year on Asia and the global transition net and zero is if you also account some of, for some of the co-benefits, in particular from reduced air pollution and better health, uh, our report estimates by 2030, you'll be saving something like 350,000 lives a year in Asia. And if you add those costs, uh, those are realized much earlier. And um, we find that by 2030, um, on an annual basis, in terms of economic costs, you're already kind of in, in the black, meaning that the benefits you're getting are, are greater than the costs. Um, uh, and the costs there are really estimated, again, as economic costs, which are mainly caused by price changes and reactions to price changes. The financing cost is a different issue, and which is what gets a lot of the attention because because they're, they're really huge in terms of the amount of investments that need uh, to happen. And let's talk about the investments that need to happen. Uh, let, let's get a sense of the magnitude. It's a staggering amount of money that's going to be required to make that transition to net zero by 2030. So give us some estimates. And I think Thomas wanted to react as well uh, to what you just said, Albert. It's always nice to have a little bit of disagreement going on. So go ahead and respond, and then we'll talk about the costs. How, how much is it going to take? Go on, um, Thomas, make your response. I, uh, I didn't want to disagree uh, with <laughs> Albert. <laughs> I just want to say, I think it's, it, it is, as Albert said, important to distinguish between the welfare cost or benefits and the economic cost as measured by GDP relative to a baseline or a counterfactual, right? I mean, in, in, in terms of modeling and in terms of welfare, I think we get very similar results, in particular if you think about the co-benefits in terms of, of, of health, uh, just to say. Um, Thank you. Well, well, let's talk about the cost now. We're talking about the staggering numbers needed in terms of investments uh, in order to uh, transition to net zero. So, so give us a sense of what this will be. How much is it going to take? So we, in our report, we estimated that the economic costs are about, not that high actually, 0.8% of GDP a year. Um, and uh, if you think about the fact that fuel subsidies, which are a negative carbon <laughs> tax, are around 1% of GDP still in the region, that just by phasing those 
uh, fuel subsidies out and maybe using them to promote the green energy transition, you already get pretty far, at least in terms of the economic costs. The finance, financing costs are higher, and I, actually I have an IMF estimate <laughs> for the uh, financing needs for Asia, and that's that it would be $1.1 trillion annually to cover the mitigation and adaptation needs uh, needed to meet the nationally determined contribution targets of all of the countries in Asia, and that there's a financing gap of about 800 million, so most of that uh, required financing is not really happening. Um, and in addition, there's a private financing gap where obviously for that amount of money you need to mobilize private sector financing. Multilaterals and governments don't have uh, nearly enough. And in Asia now, private climate finance accounts for about 40% of total climate finance and it needs to get up to 80 or 90% finance. And that's one reason, you know, at ADB we've committed to really elevate the amount of money we're trying to mobilize for climate finance. We've had a pledge of $100 billion for the period 2019 to 2030. We're mobilizing more by revisiting our capital adequacy framework to leverage uh, more lending uh, in the future. Um, and we're also, this year, really trying to uh, undertake what we're calling the private sector shift, which is try to orient a lot of our activities to leverage more private sector financing and engagement and develop the private sector um, in our member countries. Okay, so I, I guess my follow-up is why the shortfall? Why the 800 million shortfall? Is it because, as we've said at the start of the session, is because policymakers are worried? They're worried about the short-term impact costs of climate action. And is that why we're seeing the shortfall of the funding required to actually manage the transition to net zero? Um, so again, you know, Thomas Albert, you, you know, as economists, macroeconomists, development economists, as well. Well, I mean, it? every country has a very different fiscal position, and especially poorer countries, it's not clear how you would expect them to mobilize high amounts of money. And also, to be honest, those poorer countries generally have not contributed much to global emissions historically, and also. Um, if they reduce emissions because there tend to be smaller economies, they're not going to ha have as big of an impact on meeting the global uh, emissions reductions that we need. So I think they uh, rightfully focus more on adaptation and rely and expect hopefully more financing coming in from the outside as well to help support um, uh, efforts to decarbonize when it's more efficient to do so in uh, th those countries than in richer countries, which is often uh, uh, the case. But the big private sector gap, I think, is the area where we need to focus more. I mean, and if you talk to uh, private companies who are thinking about investing, um, and especially internationally, um, like a renewable energy company that wants to invest in that country, there's still a lot of risks that they perceive which make them hesitate, even though in some general sense it's very profitable now to build new renewable energy plants. And uh, it's related to how the electricity prices are regulated in these countries, the quality of the grid and management that they'll be able to take off the energy that's produced, um, other types of uh, policy risks or exchange rate risks, and you know, you can go on. And I think um, what we're trying to think about, and not just us, World Bank has a, um, uh, MEGA, they're, they're trying to guarantee, putting guarantees that can reassure private sector actors to go ahead with investments to basically help de-risk some of the things that we're able to do to promote greater. And so we're just in that process. And we also need to support um, member countries to implement reforms that are more friendly to foreign investment, uh, that reform the pricing and the infrastructure capabilities of their electrical grid systems et cetera, to kind of make, create an environment that's gonna support uh, ramping up of private sector investment. Yeah. Um, I guess that brings me to my next question, which is, um, you know, we heard Tanaka-san in that introduction uh, really suggest that the cost to transition to net zero uh, by 2050 is less costly than if current policies remain in place. And again, you know, in line with what you've just been saying, Albert, this really is dependent on a country's own economic structure, its reliance on and dependence on fossil fuels. So 
are we seeing this transition happening with uh, policymakers? Because I guess the premise of this, this session is to say, well, policymakers really aren't acting quickly enough to try to um, mitigate the impact of climate change, that they aren't making those policy changes that are necessary quickly enough. Um, or are there perhaps some other factors at work? Is there political will? Or what, what do you think standing in the way to, that's preventing people from uh, acting quickly? Thomas? Uh, a, f a few uh, remarks. So maybe coming back to sort of uh, simple macroeconomic consideration. One, and I think, is the collective action problem. Everybody is, is sort of waiting. If one country I I introduces a carbon price or measures that in the end produce the equivalent of a carbon price increase. And here, if you look at recent work, for example, that the IMF has done on an international carbon price floor as sort of a way to have resolved the collective action problem, you need to lift uh, the carbon tax or the equivalent from something which is now below, below 10 dollars per ton of CO2 emissions to something more like 70 to 80 dollars a ton by 2030. So it's a substantial amount. And if one country does it and other, other countries don't do it, then you have huge shifts or dislocations in, uh, in competitiveness. It will have impacts for industries sort of the division of labor in, in the global economy. So I think that is a big challenge, and, uh, it, and it's one that still needs work. And I think, you know, by the IMF, the multilateral development banks just to find a solution and, and, and kick off. Um, and, and the second thing, I think, in terms of macroeconomic and overall economic policy management, it's still a huge task. I mean, part of it is the carbon price, but then also organize the sector, as Albert uh, mentioned. For me, the financing gap measures are, you know, at the moment they're gaps against a counterfactual of sort of everything being in, in place, right? But part of it, without the policies in place or the incentives in place, be they in terms of a direct carbon tax, be there in terms of equivalent measures that in, in, impose the shadow uh, price, the incentives are not there. And then I think, as Albert mentioned, in many countries, electricity sectors would have to be reorganized if you want to have uh, private financing. Most electricity companies or the electricity sector is still run by the state with important state assets or partial private uh, sector participation. So if you want to open the sector, if you, you would have to reallocate uh, uh, losses, uh, you would have to reallocate responsibilities, you would have to ensure that the investment in the grid, which is in most countries is still a major grid update is needed to accommodate renewables, for example. And then finally, I think, sort of uh, a practical problem is also with carbon taxes uh, or the equivalent and more renewables uh, for cleaner energy, you have the issue of obsolescence of capital, all the dirty, the using fossil fuels to generate uh, uh, clean energy, there will be losses on, on that capital. If the government owns uh, uh, most of the assets in the sector, there will be substantial losses that will have to be borne. And with pop, uh, proper fiscal accounting, they will be ending up above the line in, in budgets, so there will be huge losses. So there are practical challenges. A lot of it, uh, as you say, you know, uh, centers around restructuring uh, a lot of these economies. And, but again, you know, tying back to the idea of collective action, uh, to enable uh, things to start to move in the right direction. That's really what it will entail, won't it? Um, Jessica, did you want to contribute to, uh, to this uh, point? Uh, sure. I mean, what I wanted to say about this is I don't think there's a lack of will or desire to, to be taking action. Uh, but, I mean, it's a very complicated, complex set of issues that countries have to face uh, and to address to be able to, to make this transition. 
Uh, and that requires support from the international community. It requires uh, shifts in domestic economies and domestic regulatory structures uh, in, in governance in countries. But I mean, I think ultimately, uh, as, as Albert rightly pointed out, I think it's one of the most cliche phrases in development finance, but the billions to trillions transition is, is what is required for countries to be able to make this transition. Um, and it requires all of us to think in innovative new ways about how the international community, how the MDBs uh, can support private capital mobilization so that countries can achieve the ambition that they have um, with, with support from the international community. Thank you for that. Um, well, let's go back to this idea of the, the kind of actions that are required, because yes, you know, we do know we need to step in the right direction. Um, going back to this notion of carbon pricing, which uh, Thomas has mentioned, um, and this could just really apply to policies at large as well. You know, what are some of the impacts of, of carbon pricing or a country's individual climate actions, especially in the absence of any kind of coordination? Because ultimately, it's the collective action that matters. Tell us you know, just why that matters. Um, so I think Thomas made the good point that when one country is acting and let's say raising, a, raising its price of carbon, they're worried that it's, it's gonna make their firms less competitive in a global market. And that is definitely a, a first order concern of policymakers. Um, if you look at the record of how uh, increases in energy prices based on policy shifts have actually affected competitiveness. Actually, you don't see as strong evidence of lost competitiveness as you might imagine, that actually firms operating in market environments can adjust to higher energy prices and have done so because uh, energy price is only one aspect of what makes you competitive. Uh, you know, there's so many other factors that enter a company's cost structure. Um, and so sometimes it, it leads firms to actually reform their, uh, make new investments in research and development or higher or, or more uh, efficient capital equipment. And it puts them on a trajectory of actually being more productive and more competitive in, in, some, in some cases. Um, that said, the experience we've had to date is mostly when carbon or energy prices have shifted up marginally, not huge. And the types of the social uh, price of carbon estimates we're now seeing being produced. Um, we listen, recently heard a presentation by US EPA, which is leading this calculation for US government. It, their new estimates are that it's going to be you know, close to $200, uh, which is uh, double the European ETS price right now. And that's already considered very high and probably the highest in the world of any emissions trading scheme. And so if you're talking about a much higher price, then I think it's hard to avoid this idea that that would be you know, the death knell for many firms, at least in the short term, because adjusting takes uh, time. Um, one good example is the European ETS and the CBAM policy, because they're addressing exactly this issue, right? They've already set a pretty high carbon price that um, it increased a lot recently, so now they're going to uh, face these negative competition effects or le what they call leakage, which means firms moving to other countries where carbon prices are cheaper, right? And for most of the industries covered by ETS and CBAM, the market is Europe. And so the CBAM uh, policy, which is going to basically say anyone who imports a competing the same good has to pay a carbon tax equivalent to the difference in the carbon prices to protect, to make sure the European producers producing for European market are not hurt by, by uh, following a higher carbon price. Um, that's fine. I don't think there'll be much leakage in that sense. But when we did a study of how the CBAM program would affect countries in Asia, and I mean, the punchline of that analysis was that it's not a big effect in Asia just because Asia doesn't export that much to Europe in the sectors covered by uh, CBAM. But another interesting um, result of the analysis was that even in Europe, um, the downstream industries that are buying from the ETS CBAM sectors, um, they now also, to purchase the goods, uh, their inputs, those are covered now by CBAM. So it becomes more, they can't import them, the intermediate inputs, as cheaply as before. 
and those downstream sectors, you could see firms saying, oh, I'm going to leave and, and shift. And some of them will even move to Asia. And so this reduces the overall impact of the policy in reducing global carbon emissions, which we find are very modest. And it's because the coverage of CBAM and ETS in Europe as a share of the global uh, economy, given the sectors and the countries, is still fairly limited. If that coverage increased, which it very likely could in the future, you know, we know that Canada, UK, uh, US in s some ways, uh, in a more ad hoc way, are thinking about uh, imposing maybe CBAM type um, uh, tariffs. Uh, then there will be bigger effects on global carbon reductions. But you'll still have some countries benefiting if some firms just decide this market is not big enough, I'd rather move to a place that doesn't have a carbon tax. And so this is uh, kind, kind of the trade-off. And um, one thing that I think we can say to governments, especially in the region who are worried about this, they're worried about acting first before others do, is that there are still ways in which they can support their enterprises to ease this adjustment so they're not so negatively impacted. You know, some of the emission trading systems, they have free allowances that they allocate to firms so they don't have to pay. They're basically exempt, at least temporarily, so they can adjust gradually and make the investments. And these ETS schemes also, in principle, should be collecting revenue. And that revenue can also be recycled to support investments in cleaner energy and also ease uh, the transition. Uh, so these are different mechanisms in which um, maybe this we can get past this uh, competitiveness concern yeah interesting i mean it's very inter it's a great example that you've brought up the etfs and cbam um you know the idea of sort of pol policy coordination is also really fundamental when it comes to as you say countries working together on this um we've kind of listed out some of the challenges but let's go into the policy fixes now because you know what will it take to get us to net zero, what kind of policies are in place that we're seeing around the world? And this is where I come to you, Jessica, because we know uh, the US has passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and that was passed nearly two years ago, uh, considered the US's largest investment to date in addressing climate change. So from a US Treasury perspective, what are the expected impacts on the US economy from the IRA? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, as you say, it is the largest ever investment in climate change through carbon's, uh, carbon emission reduction. And uh, you wouldn't immediately know that from the title of the act, right? But I think this goes to show the way that the United States is thinking about uh, how a climate change policy can also be a pro-growth economic policy uh, that incentives cl incentivizes climate action uh, towards growth while preventing the cost of inaction. So I think I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why we think the IRA is well designed from both the perspective of why it's good climate policy, uh, but also why it's good economic policy, both in terms of uh, creating growth, but also avoiding costs. Um, you know, so the IRA itself is a very large piece of legislation, but uh, ultimately it is a, a comprehensive incentive-based policy that has uh, tax inc uh, incentive grants, loans, guarantees, um, all with the aim of deploying clean energy, low emission vehicles, buildings, and manufacturing, reaching hard to abate sectors um, to increase the US deployment of these technologies and ultimately reduce our, our carbon emissions. And the IRA uh, implementation is expected to reduce US greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 to 40% below our 2005 levels. Um, and independent meta-analysis of estimates shows that the IRA will reduce US emissions in 2035 to an average of 20% below what they otherwise would have been. So this is a fairly significant reduction, uh, and this is why the IRA, IRA really represents a massive investment in climate uh, for the United States. Uh, but the IRA is also fundamentally a macro fiscal policy. Um, the Congressional Budget Office uh, estimated that we would uh, expend about $780 billion, uh, largely through tax incentives and programs. Um, and from an accounting expense, uh, perspective, of course, this looks quite expensive on the surface, uh, but that uh, expenditure is largely offset uh, by um, increased tax collection by the Tax Collection Service of the US, the IRS, uh, 
uh, through the enhanced ability to enforce tax collection, eliminate loopholes, but importantly also impose a, a minimum corporate um, tax. Um, but going beyond that, that strict accounting where it sort of looks kind of even on paper, when we look at the social cost of carbon, uh, this is a policy that really will pay for itself in our economy. Uh, and ultimately, we expect the IRA to reduce the annual federal deficit uh, while also having a deflationary impact during medium-term implementation. And because of the way the IRA is structured, households and businesses will, will feel a reduction in their observed prices, and that'll help to combat persistent inflation while also making it easier to control the U.S. inflation rate for the Fed. Um, independent analysis also suggests that the IRA could create up to 900,000 jobs per year. Um, and, you know, sort of more broadly, this is a policy that is good for the U.S. economy, but also good for the global economy because of the size of, of U.S. emissions. Uh, Treasury estimates the IRA will yield uh, global economic benefits from reduced greenhouse gas uh, pollution of over $5 trillion from the present to 2050. Um, and then I also just want to talk about, you know, the cost of inaction that we're avoiding by taking these measures. Uh, of course, there are obvious costs. Uh, we all know climate shocks, but also subtle and pernicious uh, costs that affect economies, uh, worker and student productivity being reduced, for example. Um, and we know that, that climate is already depressing U.S. GDP. And I think all of this uh, conversation also points to the need for us to have better um, macro fiscal tools and analytical models uh, that are really designed to take on the, the green transition and the net zero transition and, and accommodate the more broad uh, costs and benefits of climate change uh, when we're looking at our economic models. Well, let's uh, look a bit at the tools. I'm going to go to Thomas next because obviously uh, Thomas talked a little bit about the ambition gaps and that ties in with what um, Jessica's talking about to some extent. Uh, we know a lot about emission reductions and it's great to hear what the US is doing. And uh, we know what's required there in order to achieve the, uh, the net zero transition goals. But what do we know about the policies that are needed to achieve the reductions and their impact on the economy and other uh, variables of interest? Um, again, ties in with some of the tools that uh, Jessica mentioned. What does the IMF's country work suggest in this regard? Um, we released a paper on Asia's position on climate change, and part of the paper includes uh, a survey of our country authorities in, with respect to their preferences for climate uh, change policies and also uh, their views on roadblocks and obstacles to implementing policies. And there are a few uh, takeaway. One is governments in general prefer to have a multi-pronged approach where they use various instruments, that they have some carbon pricing instrument, but then they also have other instruments, uh, just not to rely just on, on one instrument. The other uh, uh, takeaway is I think there is strong hope uh, for technological improvements. I think what Albert mentioned before is, is right uh, in, in terms of the costs. I think the costs are often smaller of climate change policies than we think, and much of that is related to the relatively small share of energy and costs at the end of the day. So even if you have a, a relatively large increase in the input costs of one input, uh, the overall effect is that small. But there is one issue with the heavy uh, sort of energy intent is in industries. If you think of steel, if you think of aviation, where you have technological challenges, even with higher prices to, maintain, to continue operations in the sectors, it will be difficult without technological change. And, and then the third uh, uh, takeaway from the survey is Governments are very concerned uh, about distribution or negative distributional impacts or impact on inequality on the poor, on some sectors. Often there are important regional effects involved, uh, steel producing areas. Typically, for example, if they will fall behind, then you have uh, other issues. Um, so what does this mean uh, for policies? I think one of our uh, advice is, is to start early. With multi-pronged uh, approaches, it is more complex. Informing the, the public, uh, 
companies of what to do will take time with more instruments. So we say act early. Specifically, we, for example, took note that there's a strong preference for emission trading systems. And there the advice is put it in place early and then broaden the impact also to reduce the cost. If emissions trading is only in the power sector, then ultimate and much of the emission reduction has to be achieved through power generation only, the more the burden will fall on one sector or another, on other sectors. So broaden coverage. And then uh, second, have systems in place uh, to address the distributional impact, in particular transfers to the poor. The pandemic has again shown that targeted transfers are difficult to operate uh, even in advanced economies. So it will take time to get systems uh, ready and then thirdly uh, i wouldn't be from the imf it i didn't mention get public uh, financial management system ready for uh, green finance for green public financial management and considering the substantial increase in public investment needed uh, public financial management systems need to be ready to absorb increases in investment. The IEA has mentioned that for about 10 years, the world needs public investment uh, to increase by about two percentage points of GDP. That's quite massive. And to manage that with efficient uh, public investment and in, in, uh, efficient project management systems needs to be upgraded. Absolutely. And it's really fascinating what you've said, because it ties in a little bit about, um, it, you mentioned um, flagging up the policies early, uh, which is along the lines of what we just heard uh, from uh, Tanaka-san at the start of the session as well. You know, flag it up, people are prepared, they know what's coming, and, uh, you know, the shocks are not going to be quite so evident. Um, you know, Albert, we're talking about policy solutions, but we, we know there is no one-size-fits-all uh, policy solution when it comes to climate change. So how does this apply when, when you're taking into account the sheer diversity of the region's economies here? I mean, you've got oil and gas producing um, economies here in Central Asia. You've got Pacific Island economies uh, who are at the risk of disappearing. Economies in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, South Asia. In between, you've got large, small, high income, low income um, you know, very, very different economies with very different needs and concerns and perspective. So how to reconcile all of this when it comes to the kind of policies they need to put in play to enable, um, you know, the, the mitigation uh, with climate change? Um, th so that's a, uh, that's a complicated question. But before I answer that, I actually want to say something about the Inflation Reduction Act, because in Asia, there's actually a lot of concern about the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think all of your points are very well taken that it will, uh, you know, uh, finance a lot of new innovation that could be beneficial for the whole world um, because leading companies are investing more, et cetera. But the one concern about IRA is that it has some local content requirements that are viewed in the region as being protectionist. So, it ha you know, to qualify for uh, some of the EV uh, subsidies, um, the contents of the VEV have to all be produced in the U.S. None of the, and even the battery materials, et cetera, have to come from either, produced either in the U.S. or from countries that have a trade agreement with the U.S. Otherwise, the subsidy is not, so it, it's essentially it's a local content requirement. Um, and for many countries and regions that are, tr are producing things, you know, like, uh, uh, nickel in Indonesia, they're very concerned because they feel like this is going to put them at a competitive disadvantage. And more broadly, it, it starts to interrupt, I mean, this was an idea raised earlier of the idea that we should really promote free trade in environmental goods um, because we want to make sure that all countries can adopt green technologies at the cheapest price so that they'll do it much faster. Um, so. So that comment if, out of the way, <laughs> we're looking at policy fixes, not... Uh, you know, okay, so now to the question of the diversity. So obviously in countries that are oil exporters, the real, uh, and to be honest, they're going to face much more challenges in the green transition because uh, shifting away from what has been driving their economy is going to be very costly. 
And so for us, it's really supporting mitigation efforts. Um, and you know, one model that we have is the, this energy transition mechanism that ADB is, is promoting with um, working with Indonesia, with uh, Vietnam, with the Philippines, and other countries are interested, Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Um, and um, the challenge, of course, is to uh, retire coal-fired power plants early because um, there's this stranded asset issue, and so there needs to be some uh, financial incentive to do so, to bring a blended finance vehicle that can help um, uh, encourage these companies to retire earlier and at the same time offer financing to support renewable energy investments that can replace this large energy source. But then for other countries like the Pacific, Pacific economies are so small, you know, mitigation is not going to make a difference in the global uh, battle against climate change. Their main challenge is adaptation, right? And so on the adaptation side, I think, um, and, and by the way, you know, adaptation is also probably underfinanced relative to mitigation. Um, and adaptation is also an easier sell to many countries because there's not this um, free rider problem. The adaptation investments are to help their people adapt to changing climate. Um, but it's still hard to mobilize the sufficient amount of financing. I mean, some of the um, adaptation efforts that governments can do themselves, one is to make investments in resilient infrastructure and ADB tries to now incorporate resilience features in all of our infrastructure investment projects. Um, the other is to uh, develop policy buffer funds, to prepare for rainy days, which are going to happen more often. Um, another is, which was emphasized in the first presentation, is to think about insurance products, both for uh, actors in the economy, but also at a national level to try to come up with reinsurance um, um, schemes that can uh, cover some of the risk. And there are also multilateral risk pooling initiatives. Uh, so IMF now has a resilience and um, sustainability trust facility to support um, climate-related investments, including adaptation. And at the ASEAN Plus Three meeting just yesterday here, they were talking about starting to talk about a disaster risk financing vehicle um, to eventually also uh, provide support to countries in ASEAN Plus Three um, to uh, become more resilient. Um, and uh, so ADB also, you know, responding to Thomas's point that, and also uh, um, Jessica's earlier point that these are complex problems for governments, and Thomas's point that uh, there needs to be fiscal planning. Um, and a lot of that, part of that is just having the fiscal budget being designed in a way that they, countries can keep track of what they're doing on climate. Um, and, and, and have a plan integrated with um, other planning. So we're also supporting climate adaptation investment plans with governments, as well as fiscal planning capacity building of governments to address uh, climate change. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing on the adaptation side. Great to know. Well, uh, Jessica, I'm going to come to you next, because from a U.S. Treasury perspective, um, what is the role uh, of finance ministries in driving climate action? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think, you know, from our perspective as, as the finance ministry of the United States, uh, macro fiscal departments really have an important role to play in assessing the opportunities of climate policies uh, and modeling the costs of action and inaction. Um, but our, our view is that many of the approaches that we have today, many of the economic models, are really not built for the broad and systemic challenges of the transition to a low carbon economy. And, and so this is really an area where there needs to be more innovation. Uh, the U.S. is proud to be a member of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, along with 91 other countries. Um, this is a great forum for technical knowledge sharing, cooperation, capacity building. Uh, and along with Denmark, uh, we're co-leading a work stream on mainstreaming climate change in economic policies. Uh, so I think this is super relevant to this conversation. We just hosted, along with Denmark, the first forum on the macroeconomics of green and resilient transitions, uh, bringing together 27 finance ministries and over 50 universities, think tanks, NGOs, uh, and MDB, MDBs, including the Asian Development Bank, um, to really think about how we can develop new economic and modeling tools and analytical approaches uh, for ministries of finance to use during this transition. 
Um, because what we know is that climate change um, creates a long-lasting economic impact, and the transition to net zero will change a lot of the macro variables that we're considering. Um, and so having this better macro modeling is really key to mitigating the risks and planning for an effective transition, um, managing the downside risks, and, and also exploiting the upside benefits. So um, we think that these improved approaches can really help us to answer critical questions during the transition um, and help de decision makers in developing countries to make the right choices and to balance all of the needs that they have with their fiscal space. Um, and I mean, this is also relevant, of course, for developed economies. Uh, in the US, uh, President Biden issued the executive order on climate-related financial risk, which Tanaka san um, also mentioned with the FSB. Um, but together, Treasury and our, our peer agencies, we're working to update our own modeling and tools so that we can make sure climate change is reflected uh, in the way that we're considering our domestic policies and, and the way that we model them. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I'm actually going to move on to Thomas next because um, uh, just to bring up um, the point that Thomas made earlier uh, about the negative distribution impacts, the equality impacts, and they've been very much highlighted as an obstacle to climate policy action. But what does that mean, Thomas, uh, for the IMF and other international financing institutions like yourselves when you give uh, countries policy advice? I think uh, in, in one word, we're sort of getting granular. Um, I think what we're trying to do is, as, as Jess mentioned, we, we're trying now uh, to improve our modeling and look at the policy instruments and their impact uh, in more detail, taking into account country preferences and, and country uh, circumstances, and then also look at the potential uh, granular impact. So in our forthcoming Article 4 with China, for example, we have, we'll have an analytical piece on the emissions trading system, where we look at various options, uh, for example, the breadth of the system, power sectors plus industry or just power sector, for example, and then whether it's intensity or quantity based and what this will mean for electricity prices, other prices, and then what this also means for the distributional impact in the sense the imp budget impact for households in the first and second decile, uh, decile of the income distribution and then what this would mean for policies. We're similarly getting granular uh, also in adaptation uh, for some of our member countries, especially Pacific Islands, but also other countries with significant uh, sea line. Uh, the impact can be large. If the investment needs are large, so to look at the public financial management, uh, the investment needs integrate them and then also in debt sustainability analysis we have done. For example, most recently in, case of the, uh, in, in the case of Micronesia, our team used this, uh, our DIGNAT model, which can look at the impact of public investment, depending on whether it's standard investment or adaptation investment, on the impact it has on resilience against natural disasters, and what this means for growth prospects going forward, so you can integrate the benefits, but also the cost, and then look at what this means for debt sustainability analysis, and whether Micronesia, which has also substantial public assets, whether their fiscal system is ready to absorb the burden. So that's how we're going to, and ultimately I think in many countries the fiscal, uh, the budget will uh, have to carry some of the burden for dealing with the distributional impact, and sort of getting systems ready, and looking at fiscal space will be will be critical for our work going forward. Thanks for that. Uh, and again, you know, you, you mentioned the modeling. That all comes together and helps with designing the right kind of policies as well. So it's really fundamental. Albert, you, you're trying to jump in to say Oh, something. I want to react to the, <laughs> these kind So it's great to hear about IMS work uh, on country level modeling in China and uh, the Pacific. Um, because I think that's what we need. And it's also in the spirit of what the, uh, the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action uh, Initiative is trying to do as well, is to really make macro models fit to purpose to answer the important policy questions. And I was actually at the workshop held two weeks ago in D.C. on that um, Jessica was describing, 
Um, and it was interesting because the whole goal of that was to say, let's talk to policymakers and what do they need, what do they want to analyze, and let's bring in the modelers on their hand and say, can you do that or can you listen to what these policymakers are saying? So I think it's a great initiative and the U.S. leadership on that has, I think, really uh, been very valuable. We're actually an institutional partner. That's why I was there and one of our uh, other uh, managers in our department was there. And we're trying to support some of the developing member countries in Asia to, um, in their efforts to address specific policy questions through uh, macro modeling as well. Uh, we're, uh, one example is we're uh, having a discussion with India to try to help them think about options to meet their nationally defined contributions um, in terms of using macro models. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that and bring in the ADB side. Wonderful, always good to hear that. Um, now I'm gonna move on to these questions because I, I see that you have all been very busy asking uh, a number of questions. Um, I will get to them shortly, but I, I will just ask one more question to Jessica because you know it's really fascinating. We've been hearing about the, the US perspective and it's, it's, uh, it's very multifaceted. Um, your role specifically is also um, overseeing multilateral development banks. So what is the role of MDBs? We've heard about obviously ADBs um, uh, initiatives as well. Uh, what is the role of MDBs in supporting uh, client countries' climate ambitions? It's a crucial one. Thank you. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Albert will want to come in on this topic as well. But I mean, I think it's very fair to say that that countries are facing at the same time uh, climate challenges and macro fiscal challenges that are self-reinforcing and sort of circularly reinforcing, and that um, they need domestic policies that can jointly address these interconnected uh, sort of intersectional issues. Um, and this is a place where I think MDBs play an important role as partners uh, in knowledge management, uh, being able to help countries to assess policy options and understand how they can address this multifaceted set of, uh, of challenges together. Um, I'm, I'm sure most people have heard of the MDB evolution agenda that Secretary Yellen has really uh, spearheaded, uh, but a major theme of, of MDB evolution is thinking about how the MDBs can better address global public challenges and help their clients to address global public challenges uh, with a major focus on how do we mainstream climate change better at the MDBs. Um, and I think we are starting to see a, a whole of system uh, shift to better addressing climate. Um, and this includes uh, targeted concessionality to help countries to be incentivized to, to take climate action and other financial incentives. But um, you know, this mainstreaming of climate is more than just more mitigation and adaptation projects, uh, NDC, NDC support. It's also uh, broadening the knowledge work, the capacity building, new products like the climate change uh, and development reports where um, uh, the World Bank is looking jointly at climate change and development challenges that can help ch countries make climate informed macro decisions. Um, Policy-based lending support that can help countries take policy action that, that supports both areas. Um, but also innovative new instruments uh, to help client countries like um, climate resilient debt clauses and projects or catastrophe deferred drawdown in IDA. You know, these are really important innovations that can help clients to um, be uh, protected against the impacts of climate change uh, from a fiscal perspective. <laughs> Yeah, innovation, that's absolutely what we need. And, and speaking of innovation, I just love the, the fact that we have this app where you can all ask your questions. And there is one question that is standing out amongst all the others with 11 votes. And uh, again, you know, you, any one of you can pick this up. Um, with many countries already struggling uh, under high debt burdens, how can they reach the billions to trillions financing shift that Jessica mentioned a little bit earlier? How are they going to reach that? financing shift uh, that is needed. Thomas, maybe you can pick this up. Um, it's a challenge indeed. Uh, so one point we have started to emphasize, we have the general fiscal message uh, at our spring meetings was for countries to reduce uh, deficits, rebuild uh, fiscal buffers, and also strengthen resource mobilization. Ultimately, we think there needs to be more uh, resource mobilization for governments to tackle new challenges, including uh, climate change. If you look at uh, our member countries in the Asia Pacific uh, Department, 
revenue mobilization is, is low among the major emerging markets. Tax ratios are sort of just about at 10%, much lower than elsewhere. And we think with tax reform, there is, is, is scope uh, to, to, to increase revenue. Um, and I think then uh, some of the climate change policies uh, Need, you know, to implement and open the way for, for private investment. And part, Albert mentioned our resilience and trust fund, and part of that lending is really to put system and frameworks in place then for uh, the, the government to be a catalyst for, for, for private financing. That's a, an important goal. And maybe before I give the floor to Albert, just to say the IMF, of course, also support the, supports the efforts of the coalition of finance ministers. And, and similarly, we, we're not an MDB, but as an IFI, we have also mainstream climate change and focus in particular on fiscal policies but then also financial sector policies uh, in, in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Albert. And, and by the way, you know, uh, we look to IMF uh, in their leadership on modeling some of the macro effects of climate change. And in fact, we're having a short course in our department to, for IMF researchers to come explain the models that they've been developing recently so that we can, uh, you know, share experience uh, in the modeling uh, approaches. Um, so, how to finance uh, this, uh, these needed investments when debt levels are already high? Um, we also have been, especially uh, our, pres our current president, President Massa, has really emphasized domestic resource mobilization. So, we set up a tax hub to provide assistance to countries to think about ways that they can increase, um, uh, generate more revenues. In Asia, we had a report a couple of years ago that showed that the kind of um, uh, rev government revenue to GDP ratio is uh, something like 17%, which is still much lower than in advanced uh, countries. So there's definitely scope to increase uh, tax revenue mobilization. The other thing is, and I actually wanted to mention it when uh, uh, you asked me to comment on, oh, the diversity of different countries, because one dimension of diversity is also rich countries versus poor countries. And so these debt sustainability issues and then how do you finance investment is particularly acute for the poor countries. And one way to, obviously it would be good for um, advanced countries to, number one, meet their pledges to provide finance to poor countries, which is part of the Paris Agreement. Um, and we also have a new loss and damage fund that has been set up also through the COP process uh, agreement to also finance uh, climate investments in poorer countries, especially in Pacific economies, but others as well. Um, and, but there's another market-based mechanism that can also be used to transfer resources from north to south, and that's through kind of a global carbon offset market, right, which is facilitated by Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And um, ADB is also trying to support uh, countries, and typically this would mean a rich country has an NDC target, and there's a poor country which also has an NDC target, um, and the rich country, if it wants, it can pay a poor country to do additional carbon reductions and get credit for it towards their NDC target. So that creates an international market. Um, and it's advantageous because usually it is cheaper to reduce carbon in a poorer country than in a richer country. And so there's a margin where, uh, I'm not sure how you set the price, but hopefully you can set a price where it provides some new financing in poorer countries to implement um, carbon reduction projects uh, and mitigation projects, especially ones where it's been hard to mobilize finance. So we also have an initiative ADB on natural capital um, financing um, of, of projects uh, that try to preserve natural resources like mangroves and forests um, and would really benefit from this kind of offset market financing. But that requires capacity building in the developing country because if you think about it, they need to show they have a clear plan on how they're going to meet their NDC targets and they have a clear plan for how they might have additional reductions beyond the NDC targets in a way that is credible to the country that wants to buy this. Otherwise, they're going to be too worried about greenwashing, that, that they'll somehow get blamed that they paid a, another country 
to reduce carbon, but it was kind of double counting. And, and so um, we're working with uh, developing countries to develop their capacity to document these types of um, carbon reduction projects in a way that's credible to other countries. And we're also trying to support, be a middleman. So we have a Climate Action Catalyst Fund that we just announced where richer donor countries can um, invest in the fund and then ADB will work with them and present projects that have been prepared by developing member countries. Um, and they can see whether those look good and then uh, that can facilitate this Article 6 trade uh, where ADB is kind of helping to build capacity and verify the quality of the deals to give uh, greater reassurance to the sellers in this market. Uh, and this is another way to finance um, more carbon reduction activities in poor countries. Sure, that's great. And in fact, you've answered one of the questions that was going to follow up from that, which is, should some countries bear propor proportionally a higher cost? Um, and you know, you've already answered that one, so I'll skip that one. I'll ask one more question from the list, because there's quite a number of questions here. Um, here's another one. We were talking about, um, about aging in the report that came out from the ADB just um, two days ago. Um, and this is really a question about the fiscal risks on retirement accounts stemming from climate change, uh, as these are long-term liabilities. So, so what are they exactly? Is this something we need to be worried about? Is there something that either of you want to pick up? I'm not sure that connection, I understand the connection to uh, aging that... What is the uh, fiscal risk on retirement accounts? So um, in terms of stemming from climate change, because these are long-term liabilities with retirement accounts. Okay, so I, I'm guessing this is somehow about how retirement funds are yeah, invested and yeah. that somehow this increases uh, risks. Um, I, would, I would say that I, I'm not yeah. so expert. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. But just reacting, since we did talk yeah. about the aging yeah. challenge in yeah. Asia, that population aging is happening extremely rapidly in many of the member countries. And countries are different parts of this process, but almost all countries are aging fast. Um, and so they need to start planning now and urgently. Um, so this is about the design of pension systems a bit and how funds are managed in a way that can secure uh, future um, obligations of the government. Obviously, if, if it's a defined contribution system where the government is conservative and it takes in the money and invests it prudently and diversifies the investments, it can probably avoid m much concern about uh, risk if, it, if, if it's doing a good job. Um, but of course, some, uh, some uh, pension schemes are not financed that way. They're pay as you go where, you know, we'll pay you, we'll see what, how much money we have when the time comes, right? And then that could be subject to much more risk if, if climate disasters become much more frequent, especially in countries that are more subject to those risks. Um, so I think it, I th it just means the government really needs to be thoughtful to, I think, address this question to, to prevent that from being, that type of risk exposure from for being too, okay. too excessive. Great. Maybe ahead, I, I just yeah. can add sort of maybe some general financial sector <laughs> considerations sort of, and, and I, I also understood the question be more sort of for defined contribution pension plans and, 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 and their investment. So our, in our financial sector assessment programs, we have started to assess climate risks. Um, and part, also the IMF is part of working with financial regulators and central banks on preparing financial markets for these risks, uh, for having catalogs, uh, for standards for climate reports by companies, uh, which all ultimately then all create the underlying in assets for right. these investment funds. And I think to, to many of the risks of climate finance and the assets affected are longer term risks, for, except for some countries that are already acutely affected. But most of the assets, the, the risk will materialize 20, 30 years uh, 
down the road, and I think it's preparing financial institutions for cataloging the risks, assessing the magnitude of the risk, looking at correlations of the risks, and then redefine their asset strategy. And there, I think pension funds are not necessarily different from, say, banks, which have to do the same uh, thing as do other uh, financial institutions. Okay, good to know. I hope that uh, was a good response to whomever asked that question. Um, I'm going to end uh, with our final question now. Um, so for folks who did ask great questions, uh, please do come and find our experts. Uh, you can perhaps pose your question a little bit later. It's just we're running a little bit out of time. So I'm going to end on a brighter note. We have been talking about climate change and obviously there's all of these factors that are quite negative that kind of is a bit of a downer for most of us let's face it the impending doom of uh, not hitting the the climate targets that uh, we've already surpassed actually uh, for this uh, this decade um, but let's talk about some of the positives I mean what are the potential opportunities and I know you've all talked about this but give us a sense of the uh, the potential uh, you know, opportunities the green transition presents uh, to economies, especially economies that are moving quickly on this. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Let's take advantage of them. What, what are they? And we talked a little bit about innovations right. as well, so you can tie those in. Uh, economists tend to be technological optimists. Yep. Um, I recently was looking at uh, global FDI data, well, FDI data in particular into the Asia Pacific region, and one thing that's very striking is the sectors where we're seeing FDI coming in have, are so different now than they were 15 or 20 years ago. And there's a huge amount going into renewable energy um, compared to before, to semiconductors, high-tech um, sectors. Um, and so I think it shows you these are kind of the opportunities of, of the future, where future um, business activity and productivity growth uh, can occur. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention in the question about how do you finance, you know, new investments is uh, for things like renewable energy, in, a lot of, in many cases, you don't need to use public finance because private finance will be very happy to do it for a profitable project. And because renewable energy production has become so cheap, it's often cheaper than using fossil fuels. And so it's just setting the conditions to mobilize the private finance to come in and uh, do that. Um, and moreover, some of the countries, I mean, China stands out, of course. It made early bets on supporting development in renewable, in solar panels and batteries and EVs. Now, of course, they're getting <laughs> accused of overproducing in these areas. But I think maybe that's uh, a, a bit jealous that they've been so successful. And now, of course, the U.S. is also making big bets in supporting innovation in these areas. I'm sure it's going to take uh, global innovation to the next level. I think that many countries should realize this is kind of where the future is going and they should be developing their own innovation potential uh, to attract foreign investment, learn from companies that are producing. We already see, for instance, China, um, the big EV producer BYD is now building production facilities in several countries in Southeast Asia. That's an opportunity because just like China learned from foreign direct investment, other countries now can learn from the foreign investment in, in you know, the, the, the growth industries and try to develop their own capacity as suppliers, as other types of support industries, and eventually even producing uh, their own. So I think you could think of this as just, an, I, I think we, in many ways, we really are in a new era of technological innovation that seems to be just accelerating. And so maybe this can make all of these transitions um, much easier to achieve. Nice bright note. Thank you for that, uh, Jessica. Yeah, I mean, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think the, the clean transition is something that will permeate the whole economy, right? I mean, this is not uh, a small sector. Uh, it's, it's really everything that we're going to be doing in the future. And, and so we don't need to have a sort of a winner-take-all competitive uh, ideology about it. We can see that every country is going to be able to play a role in this new economy, create a comparative advantage for itself. So countries need to think about you know, where they can play that role. As Albert said, I mean, for some countries, this will be carbon sinks and, and selling those you know, carbon offsets uh, into the global market. For others, it'll be technology innovation uh, exports. So I, I think there's a role for, for everybody here to win and, and build a, a global economy that's working for everyone.
Thank you. And finally, Thomas. Um, I, I agree, of course. I think on the technology side, it's uh, very exciting and Im impressive. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, when we looked at climate change and the macro impact, the assumption was always that renewable energy would be per kilowatt hour much more expensive. Now it's at par with some of fossil fuels or even uh, cheaper. There are other, there's other innovation around hydrogen, for example, or battery technology, uh, where advances have been much more rapid than expected. And maybe to add some optimism um, uh, in other areas, if you look in the financial sector and, and central banks and regulators getting ready, I think there's a lot of progress in uh, upgrading the system going in similar in public financial investment there's a lot of interest for our programs and public a green public financial management so countries are moving along and and, and preparing so hopefully that then uh, you know uh, will lead to the last step also to uh, accelerate some of the climate change policies needed well, thank you so much. And uh, I hope one of the ways that we can get there is also by the fact that you all were taking lots of notes and, and, and you know, obviously taking to heart all of the advice that you have heard on the stage from these amazing panelists. So please, a big round of applause for our experts here on stage. And uh, once again, you know, what a great session that was. We really got so many insights about how to manage uh, these policies, how to come up with you know innovative new ways to really model and uh, you know policy design so important and that's the way forward when it comes to trying to avoid climate change thank you all audience this has been a great session and uh, thank you for attending